Hello, Dr. Gomez here from the University of Texas South San Antonio, and today we're going to talk about osteomyelitis or infection of the bone. In terms of the pathogenesis, it's important to know that Staphylococcus aureus is the most common pathogen causing osteomyelitis, bacterial osteomyelitis in the United States and in the world. And some of the strains are medicinal and resistant. Other organisms that you should remember for test is uh, Salmonella for sickle cell patients, that is very common, and Pseudomonas and Klebsiella in IVDA patients. In Europe and Middle East, Kingella kingii is very common, but not as common as Staphylococcus aureus. So osteomyelitis is divided into two different categories. One of the divisions will be regarding the routes of disease spread and the other one on the progression. So the progression will be acute, subacute, and chronic, and the routes of disease will be the most common, which is hematogenous uh, through the blood infection through the bloodstream and very usually in septic patients that have other findings like septic emboli in the lung and perhaps multifocal osteomyelitis. Uh, common example is discitis osteomyelitis in IVDA patients that have used infected needles. Contiguous spread is common in ulceration. We see that very often in diabetic food that has ulceration and pathogens from the skin are extending all the way to the bone. And obviously in paralyzed patients, because they're bedridden, they develop the cubitus ulcers and they uh, develop osteomyelitis of the sacrum or the bones around the hip joint. And last, uh, direct implantation, which is the least common. This one is the iatrogenic and associated to placement of hardware to correct for fracture or any other bone pathology or any bone procedure that extends into the bone or around the bone. Hematogenous spread is the most common way that bacteria will get into the bone and infect it. And usually this happens in the area of the metaphysis because the blood flow in this region of the bone is very slow and the endothelium has this continuity which makes it permeable. So because of that, the bacteria or pathogens just go out of the vessels and into the bone through those holes in the endothelium. Uh, bimodal distribution related to the blood, blood, blood supply common in less than 18 months of age and adults. Remember that in children with an operant growth plate, the growth plate will serve as a barrier and won't let the infection go from the metaphysis into the epiphysis. And that's why we see uh, extension of pus, like in this example, uh, from the metaphysis into the superosteal space and not into the epiphysis and what we call a superosteal abscess that we see on kids. Hematogenous spread, as we said before, in adults is very commonly seen as discitis osteomyelitis. Here we have an example of a young patient with open growth plate with infection of the bone with hematogenous spread. So in the AP view is a subtle finding, but we see some lucency here in the lateral aspect of the metaphysis. The growth plate looks fine and the epiphysis definitely looks fine. In the MRI, the findings are definitely more obvious. And what we have is edema throughout the metaphysis uh, here. And what we see here is a little small abscess uh, around the surface of the lateral proximal uh, tibial diametaphysis. And this is extension into the infection into the superosteal space. That's called a superosteal abscess. Please note that because the growth plate is still open, the infection goes to the superosteal space and not through the growth place into the epiphysis as it serves as a barrier. I'm sure you've seen a case of this, this chitis osteomyelitis. We have T2, T1 fat sat post -GAD images. Uh, so T2 and T1 fat sat post -GAD. And we see that there is um, edema about the L5 or sorry, the L4 hyphen L5 disc with diffuse enhancement on the end plate. And there is some epidural phlegmon here and it's causing indentation upon the thickal sac. So this is very common hematogenous spread of osteomyelitis in the adult. And we see them very often in IVDA patients and also in diabetic patients. The second mode of spread is contiguous spread uh, associated to ulcers. In this case, a diabetic foot with an ulcer around here and first, second, third, and fourth metatarsal bones. And there is 
extension through phlegmon and abscess into the second and third metatarsal diaphysis with enhancement of the bone marrow, and this is consistent with osteomyelitis. Uh, further on, we're going to describe the signal characteristics of osteomyelitis in MRI. Uh, contiguous spread is common in diabetes because they have a diminished immune response, um, they develop ulcers, and because they have loss of sensation, the microtrauma usually ends up with um, ulceration and infection. The least common mode of spread of infection is direct inoculation. And this is just direct seeding of pathogens or bacteria into the bone from an open fracture, insertion of metallic implants, as we see in these films, uh, joint prostheses, arthroplasty, human and animal bites. Those are really, really, really bad and uh, usually get really, really serious infections and puncture wounds. In this case, we have a anti-grade static intermedullary rod fixation of the tibia that we see here. And there is no any healing. There is no bridging callus formation here around the fracture site. And when we did the CT, the rod not only is invading the articulation, which is really a bad sign, there is peri hardware lucency all over or all around the rod, more than two millimeters. And this was just an infected um, hardware. There's a soft tissue component here as well. And as you can see, some ulceration. So direct inoculation is the least common, but if you work in a place that has an orthopedic clinic, uh, especially trauma, you will get to see uh, direct inoculation osteomyelitis. Now we're going to describe the different imaging modalities that we use to evaluate osteomyelitis and bone infections. I am not going to talk about bone scan, but bone scan is very useful, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So the most common is the radiograph. The important thing to know about radiograph is that early osteomyelitis is really not seen on radiograph. It's only seen on MRI. It's also not seen on CT. So we have here AP and lateral views of a kit with the open growth plate. And there is a metaphyseal lesion that we see here. And this is just, you know, advanced osteomyelitis has already had some time for the bone to activate the osteoclastic activity and have that lucency. One thing you I want to point out is that osteomyelitis is a benign process, but it's aggressive. So the way we see it on radiographs and on imaging studies is of an aggressive lesion. And sometimes in some situations, it's really hard to distinguish between osteomyelitis and a malignant lesion. So what do we mean by that? Notice that the zone of transition of this lesion is very wide. The borders are just not well defined, which means that it's an aggressive lesion. And in the lateral view, we can even see that there is cortical destruction and uh, again, a very wide zone of transition. As we described before, the growth place of uh, the bone acts as a barrier. So you can see that the infection is not crossing to the epiphysis. Now we're going to talk about CT scan. CT scan has very good resolution, but very low soft tissue contrast. MRI will have very high uh, soft tissue contrast. CT scan in general terms is better for the evaluation of osteomyelitis, specifically cortical destruction, pre reaction because it's bone formation, formation of a sequestrum, which we are going to describe a little later on, and intramedullary gas. Now, this thing you can see in MRI, but there are much better seen on CT scan because of the high spatial resolution. Uh, please remember that a normal CT scan does not exclude early osteomyelitis because the only thing that you see at early hematogenous osteomyelitis is just subtle bone marrow edema. And it is also very good at CT guided procedures. A little bit about CT guided procedures or procedures biopsies for osteomyelitis is controversial because a lot of the biopsies that we do of the bone don't actually grow any organisms, but it is still the gold standard for the infectious disease doctor and is um, ordered a lot in tertiary hospitals for the definite diagnosis of osteomyelitis. So here we have a CT scan of an infected sternal fracture, and this is a good case to see how helpful the CT scan is, especially when used with an MRI. Here you can see that there is a displaced fracture of the inferior aspect of the sternum. And the things that we can see is that the borders of the fracture are very sharp, which goes with fracture, and that there is early lucency around the fracture pattern. We can also see that there is abscess formation in and about 
the fracture pattern. With the CT scan and the sharp margins, we can tell that this is a fracture that became infected. In the MRI, it would be more difficult and it will be hard to differentiate between infection of the sternum that ended up causing destruction a pathological fracture versus a fracture that got infected. So in this case, because of the high spatial resolution of CT, it is helpful, helpful to differentiate. So now we're going to talk about MRI. MRI is very sensitive, but not specific for infection. As you know, early hematogenous osteomyelitis is seen as early bone marrow edema. And that can be caused by many conditions, including trauma, tumors, and other things that just cause edema of the bone. The one thing you have to remember is that in MRI, infection and osteomyelitis is defined by its T1 characteristics. Low. T1 signal intensity within the bone marrow in the clinical setting of infection is consistent with osteomyelitis. High T2 weighted signal intensity, which is consistent with edema, is not diagnostic for osteomyelitis because it can be related to reactive edema. So in the MRI protocol for infection, it should have axial sagittal and coronal planes, and it should have T1, some fluid sensitive sequence like T2 with fat side or steer, and uh, post catalinian images if possible. You don't need the post catalinian images to make the diagnosis of osteomyelitis, but it helps to assess the extension of infection, including surrounding abscess and soft tissue component. T2-weighted images are, as you know, pathologically sensitive because they see edema very well, but a protocol without the T1 for infection will be kind of worthless because the T1 Sequences are the one that define infection. Also, proton density images are not that important in infection because they are more useful for interarticular structures such as fibrocartilage, meniscus, and labrum and tendons. It is not that is completely useless, but it is not as important as the T1, T2 with fat suppression, and the T1 fat sat postcatalinium. So let's evaluate this T1 and T2 images. This is a Brody's abscess, which we're gonna describe a little bit later on the conference. So this is the T1 and the T2 weighted images. So the T1 images are the anatomical and T2 the pathological. You can see in the T2 all the edema around this intraosseous abscess. And that is osteomyelitis because on the T1 images, it is seen as decreased bone marrow signal intensity, and that is diagnostic for osteomyelitis. So now we're going to talk about the classification of osteomyelitis according to the progression from acute to subacute to chronic, and each phase of progression has its typical and characteristic imaging findings. So acute osteomyelitis is defined as symptoms that have lasted less than two weeks. Uh, bone marrow edema you see as early as one to two days post-infection in hematogenous spread on MRI. Remember, it will be very sensitive but not specific. Always remember, the diagnosis of osteomyelitis is defined by low T1 signal intensity in MRI. I'll be repeating that over and over and over. Uh, in acute osteomyelitis, we can see intraosseous edema and replacement of the bone marrow and superiosteal abscess, which we see in kids. There is hypoenhancement of some regions of the bone because the bone is dead and necrotic and you can assess for phlegmon and abscess in MRI. So we have here axial and sagittal ankle images of a young patient that have developed osteomyelitis of the distal femoral metaphysis. You see some regions of edema and no edema that is part of the infection and osteomyelitis and also regions of necrotic bone. If this was an enhancing image, those regions of necrotic bone Will, would not enhance. When you have this edema in the bone, the bone starts to increase the pressure, the intraosseous pressure, and all this pressure wants to escape somewhere. In a pediatric patient like this one, this pressure, what it, what it did is that it, it created some cortical breakthrough at the posterior metaphysis and extended into the superiosteal space. And this patient developed a large superiosteal abscess, which we commonly see in pediatrics patients with acute osteomyelitis. It is important to know that the growth plate serves as a barrier to stop the infection from extending from the metaphysis to the epiphysis. So instead of going into the epiphysis, the infection extends through the cortex into the superiosteal space. 
And this is how we see it in ultrasound and superiosteal abscess. This is the cortex of the bone. Uh, this is the periosteum. And everything that we see inside here is the debridement and the abscess at the superiosteal space. So superiosteal abscesses, if they ever ask you in a test question, can be seen in ultrasound. So let's talk now about subacute osteomyelitis, also known as Brody's sepsis. So as the pressure continues to increase within the bone because of the infection, there is more bone death and eventually develops an abscess, an abscess within the bone. So what we see in radiographs and CT is just a loosened lesion with very thick sclerotic borders because it's of intermediate aggressiveness, uh, osteomyelitis. And we want to describe the classical findings that we see in MRI. So we have a radiograph here, AP and lateral views, and what we clearly see is a very well-defined lesion within the proximal tibial metaphysis that extends into the epiphysis. And as you can see, this lesion, although it's well defined, has thick sclerotic borders. These borders are not as thin as if I would draw a line with a pencil. If I'm drawing a line around here, around the loosened lesion, the border, the thick sclerotic border goes beyond the line. So it's a loosened lesion, but with thick sclerotic borders. We can see that on CT, we still see that loosened lesion of dead bone, but we can clearly see now how thick the border is and sclerotic. So in terms of physiology of the bone, this means that this lesion is of intermediate aggressiveness. It has sclerotic borders, so it means that the body is able to have a semi-adequate response with osteoblastic activity trying to stop the progression of this infection or osteoclastic activity which is activated by the increased vascularity but at the same time because of the thick sclerotic borders we can tell that this lesion is still active so here we have an mri and we're going to describe the characteristic findings for a brody sepsis these are t1 and these are t2 images and brody sepsis is characterized by four rings we have four rings that we can see on MRI. So the first ring is the abscess itself, which is high on T1, high on T2, and low on T1 signal intensity. Because it's fluid-like, all this center or, in, or first ring just would act like any other fluid in the body. The second ring is the most important because it's the one that is really characteristic for infection, which is this thin line of increased T1 signal intensity and low to high T2 signal intensity and would show enhancement. And that is called the penumbra sign. And the penumbra sign is granulation tissue at the borders of the abscess and is very characteristic for Brody sepsis. Then the third ring will be this sclerosis or low T1 and low T2 signal intensity uh, um, ring around the penumbra or outside the penumbra and that's related to fibrosis and bone production or sclerosis and then the last ring is just that extensive edema or reactive inflammation around the lesion itself just to see a post gadolinium images this is t1 post gadolinium obviously with fat suppression and we can see the very well-defined penumbra sign which is that thin enhancing ring of granulation tissue about the fluid part of the abscess or pus and in this case the patient is actually going almost to chronic osteomyelitis because it's creating a cloaca it is the bone is finding a way to expel that pus and intraosseous pressures outside after two weeks of infection we arrive to the chronic stage of osteomyelitis. This results from osteonecrosis related to increased intraosseous pressure and disruption of the blood surprise. It can result in a sequestrum, which is a piece of bone inside a broad sepsis, which is hard to treat because it is devascularized and antibiotics don't get to it. Also, we can see new bone formation, which is also known as involucrum. As we briefly discussed in broad sepsis, it can create a cloaca, which is a track uh, from the intraosseous abscess to the soft tissues, which is the bone trying to expel all this pus and intraosseous pressure. And it can actually 
end up in a sinus tract, which is another tract from the soft tissues into the outside of the patient. So we have here a diagram of the findings that we would see in chronic osteomyelitis. So in the color green will be the intraosseous sepsis, and this piece of bone here is kind of a dislodged devascularized bone that is floating within the abscess, and that is known as the sequestrum. And that piece of bone is completely impregnated with bacteria and it's important to know that usually medical treatment doesn't get to treat it because a blood supply doesn't get into that piece of bone inside the abscess. That intraosseous pressure creeps increasing and what it does is create this tract to get outside the bone and this is called the cloaca. It's another part or finding of chronic osteomyelitis and because there is so much infection around this abscess you the bone starts creating this thick periosteal reaction and that thick periosteal reaction is known as the involucrum so there are three terms that you should know for the test sequestrum cloaca and involucrum and they are all related to chronic osteomyelitis keep in mind that this findings that we've been describing about the intraosseous abscess sequestrum cloaca and involucrum are commonly seen with hematogenous osteomyelitis, but this is a case of chronic osteomyelitis related to chronic ulceration in a, in a patient that has IVDA and chronic infection of the forearm muscles and soft tissues. And in this case, we see the chronic periosteal reaction at the cortex. We see some type of involucrum because there is thick periosteal reaction around the bone, but this can also be related to the chronic edema surrounding the soft tissues. So we don't see an abscess here and it's still chronic osteomyelitis because it's related to contiguous uh, spread and not hematogenous. So it's always good to keep that in mind. We have here AP and lateral views of the tibia with a patient with chronic osteomyelitis. And I want to show you this case so you have an example of involucrum, which is this thick periosteal reaction that we're seeing concentrically around the bone related to that intraosseous abscess probably is starting to create a cloaca to try to get out of the bone posteriorly, but the hallmark finding here is the thick, the thick involucrum around the region of infection. So we have axial images of the leg with an abscess in the tibial diaphysis with color coding to explain the hallmark findings in chronic osteomyelitis. So the first finding that we have is the abscess chronic abscess within the medullary cavity of the bone. The second finding that we see is the sequestrum, which is that the vascularite, this large piece of bone that remains inside the abscess. The third finding that we see is the cloaca, which is that tract that goes from the intraosseous abscess to the outside of the bone to try to get rid of the pus and the increased intraosseous pressure. The fourth finding that we see is a sinus tract, is a tract that goes from the surface of the bone to the soft tissue. So remember, the tract in the bone is called a cloaca, the tract in the skin is called a sinus tract. And here is the same finding in a CT scan, a very chronic osteomyelitis, abscess with a very large cloaca, and then we have the large sinus tract extending into the soft tissues. It's good to remember that there are complications to chronic inflammation and chronic infection. As in any other part of the body, anytime you have chronic inflammation, there is a risk for developing or degenerating into squamous cell carcinoma. There is no difference in the bone. With chronic osteomyelitis, especially the cloaca can develop into squamous cell carcinoma. And this is a case of that. We usually see the findings of osteomyelitis, but with more aggressive bone destruction, with a with growing lesion, with very ill-defined uh, borders and wide zone of transition. So, so keep an eye for that, especially for the test. That if you have chronic uh, osteomyelitis and suddenly there is acute progressive bone destruction, think about the generation into squamous cell carcinoma. So now that we've talked about osteomyelitis, the faces, the imaging modalities that we use and how they're helpful and the types of osteomyelitis that we have, let's talk about the differential diagnosis in terms of imaging, actually mostly by MRI. 
The first one is mo and most important in osteitis. You will see that a lot in evaluation of osteomyelitis for a diabetic foot. And this is when you have reactive edema related to some inflammation around the bone, but that is not enough to replace the bone marrow. And the typical findings in osteitis will be that you have increase in the T2 weighted images within the bone, but then the T1 weighted images are normal. There is no decrease in the bone marrow signal intensity with the T1. And this is called osteitis, and it's not diagnostic for osteomyelitis. Remember that osteomyelitis is diagnosed on MRI by decreased T1 signal intensity, which is actually related to replacement of the bone marrow. Another important differential diagnosis is of charcoal arthropathy in diabetic foot. As you know, charcoal arthropathy is a destructive arthropathy that can result in bone production, bone destruction, and dislocation. These findings are very similar to what we've seen in osteomyelitis, as we can see here in this patient center in the midfoot. So in charcoal arthropathy, it is difficult to differentiate between the processes of destruction associated to the neuropathic arthropathy versus infection. So when you get a request for evaluation of osteomyelitis in a diabetic foot with charcoal arthropathy, you need to assess if there is an ulcer on the foot. In the absence of an ulcer, it is impossible to know if this is infection or related to the destructive nature of the charcoal arthropathy. And in MRI, the definition of superimposed osteomyelitis is abnormal T1 signal intensity that extends into the bone that is adjacent to the ulcer tract. So this is what you expect to see in an MRI. We have T1 and T2 fat suppressed images here. And what you want to see is that ulcer, this big ulcer in a patient with neuropathic arthropathy that extends into the bone and the bone shows diffuse decreased T1 signal intensity. In the absence of an ulcer, any decrease in T1 signal intensity in a charcoal arthropathy may be due to the destructive aspect of the arthropathy and not necessarily to, the, to osteomyelitis. So remember, when you get a request for superimposed osteomyelitis in advanced charcoal arthropathy, make sure you ask if the patient has an ulcer. As we've described previously, osteomyelitis is a benign lesion or condition. However, it has aggressive imaging findings because of the periosteal reaction, white zone of transition, and bone destruction. So osteomyelitis is almost always in the differential diagnosis of malignancies in the absence of any clinical information. There is a patient that was septic, and we thought that in the differential diagnosis, we should include osteomyelitis on a lesion that we saw on the scapula because the patient was septic. We did a CT scan and there was a destructive lesion on the scapula, which appeared rather chronic because it has well defined sclerotic borders. And in the MRI, it showed diffuse enhancement in and about the lesion. We biopsied this lesion and it ended up being Langenhart cells histiocytosis. But the take home point is that because the findings of osteomyelitis can be aggressive, sometimes it's difficult to differentiate from another malignancies and some lesions may end up in biopsy, especially when the clinical history is not straightforward. Another condition that will be in the differential diagnosis will be osteoosteoma, just because the patient presents with pain and when we do imaging, we see cortical thickening, which may be confused by diffuse periosteal reaction that is not overly aggressive. And for that reason, sometimes osteoosteoma may be included in the differential diagnosis of osteomyelitis, especially in initial radiographs. Obviously, when we do CT or MRI, we can find the characteristic nidus, and that will obviously uh, give us the uh, findings that we need to make the diagnosis of osteoosteoma. Another condition that may be included in the differential di diagnosis of osteomyelitis will be a stress fracture, especially in the initial radiographs, because we could see diffuse periosteal reaction about the bone without the definite loosened line of a fracture. As we see in this case with MRI, there is a stress fracture of the metatarsal bone. We see a low T1 linear signal intensity with diffuse and extensive edema uh, throughout the bone marrow surrounding the fracture.
Uh, this may look like it's bone infection, but we need to pay attention to try, especially in a place like the metatarsal diaphysis, to see that linear low T1 signal intensity abnormality uh, to make the diagnosis of a fracture. Also, CT may be able to help like we described previously. There are some rare conditions that we always talk when we talk about osteomyelitis, and one of them will be chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis, which is also known as chronic recurring multifocal osteomyelitis. And as the name implies, it is uh, a condition that sh looks like osteomyelitis in imaging findings, obviously multifocal in different uh, bones of the body, but that is, a is aseptic. Nothing ever grows if you biopsy this bone. As expected, the patient will have normal blood cell count. Uh, they, they have symmetric bone lesions, and the lesions will have very marginal sclerosis, and the patient will have a low C-reactive protein. In chronic recurring multifocal osteomyelitis, what we see is regions of decreased T1 signal intensity at the metaphysis, and they are multifocal. So in this case, we see on the distal femur and the proximal tibia, and uh, they have T2 edema and enhancement. So very, very similar findings to acute hematogenous osteomyelitis, but it will be multifocal and aseptic. This is mostly a diagnosis of exclusion, and some of these patients end up in biopsies to confirm that there is no growth of an organism within the uh, abnormal bone marrow. Another infection of the bone that has a very characteristic name and may appear in the test is the sclerosis osteomyelitis of Garret, and this is usually related to dental caries and that extends into the mandible and it's a low-grade sclerosin osteomyelitis so what it causes is diffuse sclerosis of the mandible without uh, aggressive bone destruction or pre reaction and so when you see that uh, and diffuse sclerosis and enlargement of a mandible, think of sclerosis and osteomyelitis of Garay in your differential diagnosis, especially if the patient have multiple dental caries. When talking about bone infection, another term to remember is Pott's puffy tumor, and this is a supraosteal uh, abscess of the frontal skull associated to uh, frontal sinus infectious and disease. So there is osteomyelitis and bone destruction, and there is frontal bulging, so it looks like a tumor. And it's an important diagnosis to remember because it can uh, be associated to epidural abscesses, brain abscesses, and even thrombosis or cortical veins. So always remember uh, this term, Pott's puffy tumor, even though it says tumor on it, it's actually related to an infection of the bone. So the last condition we're gonna describe in this conference of osteomyelitis is SAFO, which is, stands for synovitis, acne, postulosis, hyperostosis, and osteitis. We get to see this in imaging because of these two uh, findings, hyperostosis or oste and osteitis. Uh, here we have an image of the ankle and we see this uh, hyperostosis or preoster reaction about the distal fibula. Uh, osteitis and hyperostosis is commonly seen actually at the clavicles and around the sternoclavicular joint. Those are really characteristics for this condition. There's another image of so the femur and we see this periosteal reaction about the uh, distal femur uh, in a patient with SAFO syndrome. Uh, periosteal reaction has its own differential diagnosis, but this is the hyperostosis related to this condition. So thank you for your attention. I hope you've learned about the imaging findings of bone infections going from acute to chronic, the imaging modalities that we use uh, to evaluate osteomyelitis and some of the important differential diagnoses. Thanks.